It literally looks like a goldfish painted red. <laughs> Hello and welcome to episode five of The Spoken Wheel Show. Now we are back, it has been a while since we filmed an episode. Episode four was um, interesting. A long, 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 long time ago. Long time ago. Yeah. And let's discuss, cause we got some interesting news. It's a new year, there's some new cars, and I'm trying to find something to end this phrase to make it sound great. So as for our luxury cars, this episode, we have the Mercedes MBUX Hyperscreen. As I call it, the M-Bucks screen. Kind of like Starbucks, but... M-Bucks. And it will be featured in the new EQS electric car. MBUX stands for Mercedes-Benz User Experience. Except experience starts with an E, e not an X. X. Stretches from pillar to pillar. Now we're talking about the A-pillar, so that means your steering wheel to your passenger door. That's quite large. Some interesting facts about this. According to Mercedes-Benz, it is a supercomputer with technology including AI. It is the biggest and most intelligent screen in any Mercedes-Benz car, and it is 42.3 inches wide. That is over three feet long. That's quite big, as you can tell. Now, some facts from Mercedes-Benz about this supercomputer. They claim it has an eight core CPU, not sure what that means, 24 gigabytes of RAM, I guess that's good. Um, a 46.6 gigabyte memory. That doesn't sound like much, but again, do you need a computer in a car? Mm -hmm. I guess you do now. So you're telling me this car can remember things. Apparently. So why does a car really need a computer like this? I, I don't know. If these cars don't have computers, they work. I mean, they work just fine. When they work? When they do work. When they're not broken down and being towed by a car with a computer, they're fine. Mercedes claims it has this zero layer concept, which essentially means that everything of it, everything is available at the touch of your fingertips. Well, if you think about any car with a regular infotainment system, you have the settings, then the sub settings, and the sub settings of the settings of the sub settings. And then the settings to those sub settings, which go to those settings right. of the sub settings. And then you have all these like the buttons settings. and really confusingness bits, and it's all a bit confusing. So you might remember on Jeremy from Top Gear, when they did the old person's car, he talked about how these infotainment systems are just too confusing. So according to Mercedes-Benz, there's no really deep settings. Everything is just either one or two clicks away from each other. Sounds interesting. Yet at the same time, I'm very confused. The last time we heard that cars have a strong glass, as we all remember the Tesla Cybertruck, when the person demonstrating the car threw a rock at it, this has Gorilla Glass. Now. Maybe their concept will work a little bit better than the Tesla's demonstration. Hopefully it does, because we all know how that turned out. Yeah, the rock went right through. It wasn't exactly bulletproof. And of course, included with this Gorilla Glass, it has context-sensitive awareness, and it can predict the function you want to use it with. And it also has extremely thin OLED screens. Okay. Now, if you have been in a Mercedes-Benz as of recent times, say 2014 or newer, you may have noticed the ambient lighting. And Mercedes-Benz ambient lighting is honestly one of the coolest features out there. And as an option, you should definitely have in one of their cars. The reason is they take every line from the door, the dashboard, bits of the steering wheel, and they light it up with these LED lights. And they're very small, and so you, you don't see And you can change them. the colors of them. Exactly, and according to Mercedes-Benz, you can do over 64 different colors. And it came out originally in the S-Class, and it's one of the coolest features, especially at night, when you can see it, obviously. <laughs> now with this, one thing they've done, again, hiding the ambient lights, rather than tucking them under the dashboard where there's a slight gap, it's built into the screen. So that little thin line you see in the screen, that's the LED lights for the ambient lighting system. Very clever. Now looking at the screen, it's divided into three parts. So you have your regular gauge cluster, which is now a screen, what would be your regular infotainment system, which is still there, and then they've added something new, a passenger display. Now on a normal car, if you have an infotainment system, the passenger usually gets nothing because the infotainment system's in the middle and the driver gets the gauge cluster. Passenger just gets the dashboard. However, Ferrari was actually, I want to say they were the first company to introduce the passenger display. They, they did it so the passenger could see the speed. I, what, did they make that a touchscreen sort of Correct. thing? Correct. So a touchscreen so the passenger can set the radio, go through settings, see the speedometer, and do a whole bunch of different functions, which is if you're a driver, it allows you to stay focused. So that's actually kind of nice. I can see my passenger set the navigation for this place or just the air conditioning. Kind of clever. 
So Mercedes-Benz has essentially just brought that in from Ferrari into their own cars. And I think soon we'll start to see in other cars, passenger displays come about. Which I think it's not a bad idea. Now the question is, with all this technology, we already know that the price of working on cars that break down nowadays are very expensive. With all these computers and all these wirings and screens and touchless this and hands-free that and AI memory seat things that don't do much except tell you how hot your seats are, how expensive will it be to fix it when it breaks? Yeah. And how long will they last? Will anyone actually buy this car or will they all be leases? And that's the problem when you buy a car so complicated you cannot work on them. That is an issue. Well, it is now time to take a nice stroll down the very curvy and twisty streets and eat a baklava on the bakery on the corner of Discussion Drive. <laughs> For our first discussion drive car, we have the Tesla Model S Plaid Plus. Now, it has, of course, the new and approved Platypus bumper for your 100% totally free convenience. One of the most noticed features in this car is the steering wheel. Everyone's like, oh, it's cool. It looks like an airplane yoke, right? <laughs> well, the one thing, it shouldn't mm -hmm. be an airplane unless you're going off a cliff. And there's a bigger issue. It's a car, not a plane. And the other thing with this wheel, it's not really functional because you, there's no top. You might be like, well, a Formula One car doesn't have a top on the wheel. Yes, except there's one difference with that wheel. You can actually hold it. That wheel does not look very comfortable to hold. Let me explain why. Now, actually, I beg to differ. In 1956, when General Motors came out with their uh, concept cars, they did have wheels that did look like this. Yes. But they had twisted handles so you could, you know. There is one difference, though. Every good steering wheel that you can possibly hold is thin. I want you to take a look at the grips at 9 and 3. It's quite thick with they all get the buttons thicker. and then, like, you, you kind of have to hold it like this, like you're a, a crab, and then drive like that. Mm -hmm. It's weird. It reminds me of the wheel on the Chevrolet C8 Corvette, which I have held before, and I'll tell you one thing. One of the worst steering wheels I've ever held. Yes, it looks cool. Yes, I like the squareness. Yes, I like the buttons. Yes, I like the paddle shifters. But to hold the Corvette wheel at nine and three is one of the worst experiences ever. I'm sorry. Just because a wheel looks good doesn't mean it actually feels good. And I can guarantee that's gonna feel the same way, which is awful. Now, of course, he hasn't actually felt it yet. So this is all subjective to his opinion, which I, in respect to Tesla, it looks good. As we'll now show you on the Cadillacs, you'll see why we like those wheels. So as you can see, the thin wheel works perfectly. You know, you can fit your hand around it, you can turn it nicely, and, and, it, and there's no problem getting bigger and smaller, and then you've got thumb area, see? Everything, when you turn the steering wheel, fits nicely on your hands, and you can grip the wheel. Works fine for me. The interior of this car features a lot of geometrical shapes. That's something new for Teslas. Usually they're all lines that just... Boring. Yeah. I mean, when was the last time I love the look of the roundness and... It's boring. It's very boring. One of the features you may have noticed with more recent Teslas is the giant iPad screen. I mean, it's giant. Well, I must tell you this. It is not only giant. It is almost bigger than most people's television screens. It is. It literally is Netflix on your car dashboard. Which, what could possibly go wrong with what that? What could possibly go wrong? With this one, like I said, the iPad was this weird vertical screen. I think it wasn't that the size of it that bothered people, but in fact it's vertical. Well, this new one, they've created into an iMac. It is now horizontal, which I think looks good, except it's massive again. But there is still one problem. What is that? The car isn't exactly as warm and as welcoming as other cars. It has sort of gotten the BMW 7 Series syndrome, sort of putting screens everywhere they can. Yeah. So what do we mean by BMW 7 Series Syndrome? You might remember in 2016, I believe, BMW- When they put the screens- Everywhere. Like everywhere. So BMW ran this commercial for the 7 Series and it had a screen on the key. It had a screen, well, the regular infotainment screen. So that's two. Then the dashboard mm -hmm. that had a digital screen for the gauge cluster, so that's three. Mm -hmm. Then the two behind the, two the, behind the seats, so that's five. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, your rear center console had another screen. That had another screen. So it was six screens, and then you could like take them out and like hold them like an iPad. It was bizarre. 
Well, the Tesla has added a screen in the back and I'm sure there'll be more you can add on. Now, according to Tesla, zero to 60 will take place in just 1.99 seconds. Is that believable or not? No idea. And according to Tesla, a top speed of 200 miles an hour, which again, no one's seen any testing or done it. And you gotta remember in the electric car because it's usually a single gear, you're gonna kind of run out of RPMs because they can rev to about 14,000 RPMs, quite a bit. But to get the speed higher, you're gonna need a transmission of some sort. Porsche Taycan, for example, has a two-speed transmission. It allows it to hit a little over 160 miles an hour. Most Teslas at the moment can only do about 130. So how they've gotten to do 200, not quite sure. Or maybe it's a CVT. Our next car on Discussion Drive is a BMW M5 CS. Now this car is sort of a lightweight version of the M5 and actually is in a very nice green color. Very nice, and I like the rims go really well with the front get grill. The gold, like it's like a, almost a bronze. And I like that they brought back bronze. You know, we're seeing everyone do the silver, and then I think mm -hmm. Mercedes and the SLS did gold, and then everyone kind of forgot about it. But the but bronze. bronze is making a comeback. Now, this isn't the first CS BMWs. Originally, you had the M4 and M3 CS. To get this straight, you have the standard M5, then you have the M5 competition. And now you have the M5 CS. Of course, compared to the old 2002 BMWs, this thing is a gigantic dinosaur monster. But this one still has the small grill. Some statistics about this car. It has 627 horsepower from the standard BMW 4.4 liter twin turbo V8, which they've been using forever now. And it weighs only 230 pounds less than the regular M5 competition. So when you say lightweight, 200 pounds, if you think about it. It's not much. You it, could just remove it, a passenger. Yeah. Take you, out a seat. Take out a seat, take out it's, some. I wouldn't say, if you're taking a heavy car, pulling off 200 pounds and then claiming it's lightweight, it's kind of a bigger issue. I mean, that's like saying I'm taking my 1959 Cadillac to the racetrack and saying, well, if I remove the cigarette lighter, it might be a bit lighter. One of the more striking features on this and notable really, cause not much has changed to be honest, is the new carbon fiber seat. But I have to say, although they're very angular, do look quite good. And I have to tell you, the red and that carbon fiber do really go, and the black inserts, I believe, on it, it looks really good. Now, one really interesting feature on this, on the seats, is the weird carbon fiber leathery bit dividing your two legs. Looking at this weird carbon fiber bit, let me give a bit of context so you can understand it. In a regular car, your legs just kind of sit in the seat and you can put them wherever. However, as you're going around a corner, they might move, although I've never really had that problem. So again, not sure. But if you look at a Formula One car, for example, on an F1 seat, it has a place for each leg. So you really are stable and you don't move around much. And BMW has incorporated that into this car's design. As you can see, there's a bit in between your legs so your legs stay stable through cornering. And, and I then, must admit, it does look a bit uncomfortable. Yeah. Like, let's say you're driving on the freeway, do you really want something in between no. your legs? And let me remind you that this is supposed to be a luxury sedan of large size. So that is, that is, of course, after If you're that, on any longer journey where you might want to shift your legs, well, you'll have some carbon fiber. And of fiber course, it legs. is a luxury sedan that is lightweight. So luxury, lightweight, eh. It took away the luxury, but replaced with something that's more expensive save weight, they're adding. Well, yeah. I do notice that they put holes in the seats everywhere. Look at look them. The yeah, colors put... look good. The color scheme scream is great, but there's holes everywhere. So is it really still a seat? If you look at the seatbelt real close, you'll see that red and the BMW M stripe really surprisingly works well together. One other feature BMW's added is these new carbon fiber paddle shifters. Now it looks like one of those aftermarket kits you see all those European people put on their cars. And it actually, that red looks like plastic. And I don't know, it's... It's interesting. It looks like an add-on, which I don't mind, but it feels a bit gimmicky. Now, one nice touch is the Nürburgring 24-hour track engraved into the headrest. As you can see with the seat, it is perforated. There are lots of holes. And essentially what they did to get the Nürburgring outline, they just didn't put any holes. So basically, anyone can do this, as I'll demonstrate. <laughs> So as my my dear friend Joey has finished his masterpiece. Yeah, so, uh, as you may or may not be able to see here, I've drawn BMW, but essentially I haven't colored in where it actually says BMW. So of course he can now be hired BMW. 
he should now be hired to do your headrests, which aren't actually headrests because they're part of the seat. If you That's would like all. this piece of paper, we'll sign it and do a giveaway. Now, moving on to the bidding panel. And the first car we have for you today is a 1980 BMW Ach. <laughs> The AHG name is uh, is actually from a dealership called Ach, uh, um, which has increased the power of the car and put a pro car style body kit on it. So I guess it's just a BMW M1 with a <laughs> package on it. Now it has a custom BMW Motorsport livery, as you can see, or just white with design some stripes. Designed by or not designed by? <laughs> I actually don't know. So custom BMW Motorsport livery. Then it has three piece BBS wheels a custom exhaust, and a full leather interior. Which was all done by <laughs> So the M1, which of course, which is named after the <laughs> dealership, uh, was actually designed by Giugiaro, uh, which of course explains its cheese wedge design. For those who don't know about the Giugiaro, all of his cars look like cheese wedges. Now, this BMW was part of a collection owned by Paul Walker. It is currently for sale on Bring a Trailer for $410,000. Moving on, we have a 1964 Fiat Abarth Monomile GT. Now, before we get into the specifics of what my dear friend wrote here, it literally looks like a goldfish painted red. <laughs> it's like... <laughs> if you look at the, the, and then that's not an out. That's I mean, what? How is this a Fiat? This, anyways. For those who don't know, Abarth is the performance division of Fiat, kind of similar to what AMG is to Mercedes. Powered by a 982 cc inline four engine, mounted to a four-speed manual transmission. Yes, that is correct. A 982 cc. That is less than one liter for a tiny goldfish that's painted red. Now, on this Cadillac behind, how many liters is that? It's about 6.1 liters. Quite a bit more. It has disc brakes and 13-inch Campagnolo wheels. Now, I do have to say, I actually quite like the wheels a lot. It's a very sophisticated design, yet compared to most modern wheels, it's actually quite simple. Some basic spokes, and then you kind of got this pattern, sort of like a roulette board. With different color, more like a checkerboard, but on a wheel. Checkerboard. Checkerboard. How does how does it check? Well, if you were to make it a circle and then divide it into so different dart, rectangles. You mean a dartboard? A dart. Yes. A well, dart see, see, look. It's got so you little, wouldn't want to get no, no, shot no, by the Italian no, no, mafia in no, no, this no, no, car. No, it's got a little Fiat insignia. That's the dartboard. Yeah. You see? It's so a dartboard. It's not, it's not a checkerboard. It's not a roulette. It's a dartboard. Dartboard. It's also been modified to be able to be raced. So you could essentially race an invented series like what they do at Monterey for Car Week with the Rolex Monterey Motorsport Union. That's a really long title. Some features that it has, a roll bar, a fuel cell, and a straight pipe exhaust. This car is currently for sale on Bring a Trailer for $80,000. You can have yourself a 1964 Red Goldfish. GM wants to eliminate all gas and diesel vehicles by 2035, so that's in just 14 years from now. Which is actually quite a while when you think about it. But still 14 years. Yeah, this is a picture of their CEO and she is 59 years old. And she'll probably be retired by 2035 since in 2035, she'll be 73 years old. And who's the CEO at 73 years old? No one, you've made your enough money and you know, by then you're like, all right, off to the golf course in Palm Springs. So according to the Harvard Business Review, most CEOs retire at age 62. So there's no way she's gonna be there till 2035. And on top of that, that means that when the big change happens, she'll be gone. So she's gonna say she's responsible for starting the change, but it didn't really happen, and the change never actually happened at all, and then, yeah. And of course, we cannot forget, they have now designed a new logo. Now here's the logo next to the old one. The old one looks very strong and it looks like GM means business while well, they are in business. The new logo looks like it's a kid's edition, sort of like you say- How Amazon does the kid's version. So. Of Amazon Prime Video. Yeah. So this is the kid's version of GM. Now this meme sums up why more car enthusiasts are moving over to FCA. On the top it shows GM and it says, we're redesigning our logo to signify our shift towards EVs in coming years and, and the younger generation of two-year-olds. And the bottom, it shows Dodge, and it says, the Hellcat motor fits in this one too, as Dodge still has a V8, a supercharged V8, and every Dodge vehicle can pretty much almost come with a V8, and they don't have any electric cars. Good on them, we appreciate it. So they say carbon neutral, but of course, what they really mean is that they can still produce gas cars, but of course, they... Won't, even though they will. During these cold winter months, we know how very important it is to have a space heater. That's why we're welcoming you to Roast My Ride. Oh yes. The first car we have up 
on our roof my ride is the Hyundai Tucson. Now, let me just say about the design, just to get this out of the way, it's a total left up. First of all, grill and headlights, they do not go hand in hand. See, grill, far away from the headlights. They, 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 they should be separate. They should not, they do not go together. Now in this car, I don't think you guys can see the grill, but you notice when you see the headlights, there's no grill near the headlights. It works. Every good looking car, think about it, the grill and the headlights are not one piece. And basically this designer, whoever designed it, god awful thing, uh, was basically paid by how many angular lines and kind of triangle-like structures he could put on the car. I mean, look at the door! What? What is happening? It's like it's got a lump, but it's like a... The designer would have been better off with an etch a sketch Smooth lines are non-existent because, of course, the headlights are now in the grill. Uh, the wheels are looking like one massive jigsaw puzzle. And uh, the lines on the body just look like... Awful. Now, Ooh. moving on to the rear of the car. Less angular lines, but it has fangs. Except they're crooked and they look... I don't know what they look like. They don't even match up. Like, it's not like the Mustang, which has it in the row, right? Yeah. And then you see, see, how, see how the outer ones are sort of like this, and then the inside ones are going tilted in. It looks, looks it crooked. It looks like fangs that need to be straightened. And It needs braces. It does. This car needs bracing. It needs to be straightened up. Shout out to Hudson and Ho Orthodontics. Contact them. <laughs> to tell you the truth, the only curved line on this car is basically where the Hyundai badge is placed, that little half moon shape thing. What is that half moon shape thing? Now, to the most important part. Yeah. The fog lights are bigger than the headlights, and the last car to do that was... The Nissan Juke. <laughs> Yeah. Which wasn't exactly acclaimed as the nicest car of all time. Like my 1959 Dodge, it has a push-button transmission. But of course, this is not exactly a push-button transmission where you actually push it in. It's just sort of... A button. A button. It's not... That you hope puts the car in gear. Now, this is the N-Line trim, which is about the equivalent of the BMW M Sport trim. So it's one below the top of the line. For a Hyundai, it'd be an N Hyundai, say the i30N. And for a BMW, be an M BMW, so the BMW M5. So this is one below that. So kind of sporty, but not quite the big one. Which, this is only more confusing because the head of BMW's M division went to Hyundai and created Hyundai's N division. So you're telling me that of all the names he could have chose, he picked the one that literally sounds most like the company he came from. Nostalgic. And now we have some exclusive footage of how they chose the name. Hmm. I have a creative idea. Instead of M, let's move one letter over to N. Mmm, I like that. No, 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 now it's mmm, I like that. Now back to the push button transmission, which isn't really a push button transmission because it's just a button. Why are there two ends? Though I know one is in the middle and the other one's over here, but why are, why why did you do that? One's for neutral and one is just a badge telling me it's the end, but like you might want to go to neutral and you press the end or you might not want to press it. The interior actually does look pretty good. I have to say, I like the seats, it's simple. The design generally in the interior is pretty nice. And the red contrast, small detail, but, but it looks quite good. But then we take a look. At the steering wheel. Which, yeah, it's a bit of a problem. Instead of a flat bottom wheel, it's now a flat middle wheel. It, uh, I, I don't know what the deal with this is. But I don't like it. I don't like it. So, there you go. We are back. This was episode 5 of the Spoken Wheel Show. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you haven't yet, please subscribe to the channel for more content to come. As always, I'm Joey. And I'm Derek. And thank you for watching. And we'll see you next time. Well, it might be a long time from now because, man, the last time we did an episode was ages, so we'll see you next time if you're still subscribed to our channel. Which hopefully you are. <laughs> Until then, bye.